All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Torah Studies. So, friends, this is where we explore the weekly Torah portion. And this week, our conversation turns to uh, something, a topic that is certainly something that's been the forefront of our hearts and minds, conversation, um, consternation, etc. And that is the topic of anti-Semitism, or uh, the way we'll frame it tonight, Haters gonna hate. That is, uh, that seems to be the nature of things. That there is hate out there, and unfortunately, Jews have been the target of a lot of that. So what we're going to do is, um, we're going to contextualize this in the in, in the conversation of the Torah portion of the parasha of the week. Torah portion this week is Bahalotcha, which is firmly uh, in the midst of the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Torah, and the the Torah portion opens with a conversation about the menorah. Now, the menorah was, as I'm sure everyone knows, the candelabra that, that was used back in the day in the Holy Temple. Our Hanukkiyot, the Hanukkah menorah that we have, is a derivative of what they lit in the temple. It's not doesn't have the same number of branches, not made out of the same material, and it doesn't serve the same purpose. It's a commemoration for when they found oil, miraculously enough, to last uh, for one day, it lasted for eight days, et cetera, uh, to, that they could light the temple menorah. Our menorah has nine branches. There's, including the shamash in the middle, the temple menorah had seven. So the Torah portion opens up with a conversation, discussion about um, lighting, kindling the menorah and what that looked like and how the menorah was made. And then the Torah portion goes off into many uh, topics, including the topic that we are going to focus on tonight. And the context as we'll see in text one, fascinatingly enough, the context is a verse that is sung in synagogues across the world, around the world. And it's I think it's a song that uh, many of us know. What is the song? I'm actually going to put this up on the screen. Give me a second here. Um, you guys have it in front of you. And it's actually, well, it's a, it's a verse that's read and it's kind of uh, sung with a tune when the ark is open in synagogues. So when you, um, when you're pulling out the Torah to read the, to read from the Torah at public Torah readings, whether it is on a Shabbat or on a Monday morning or on a Thursday morning, those are the uh, three days a week that the Torah uh, is read publicly. So um, typically this is recited. And the tune that you might've heard is, Vayahi ben Esaharon. Then it will continue. Anyway, this is not turning into Torah studies, the musical, yet. <laughs> we still have time for that. <laughs> However, hey, listen, I'm just auditioning for my Broadway debut. Um, the point of the matter is that this is... Um, what is recited when we open up the ark and we pull out the Torah? This is recited every time that the ark is open. This verse. Now, the question is, what does the verse actually mean? And that's what we're going to get into tonight. Mom, if you'll do us the honors, please, to read text number one in the English. So it was. Whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and may your foes be scattered, and may those who hate you flee from you. Thank you. Let's break this down. This is this is in reference to the Ark of the Covenant. In, in case you're wondering what the Ark of the Covenant was, it's the Ark that was made famous by Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Like the Ark, the one with the you know the the golden box with the two angelic figures on top, that box. So when the Ark set out, says the Torah, Moses had a line that he would say every time the Ark moved. Now, why was the Ark moving? Why was it setting out? Well, again, let's let's uh, let's break this down. We know that the Jewish people wandered for forty years in the wilderness between the exodus from Egypt and their entrance into the land of Israel. When they finally settled down a little bit, they they wandered for forty years. They weren't wandering aimlessly; they were moving from place to place. And every time they encamped, let me just break this down for a second. It's good to good to understand the context. Every time the people stopped, they would build the Mishkan. The Mishkan was the tabernacle, the, the portable sanctuary that they had. They would put up the, they had, it, it was a it was a building that was um, in pieces. So they would put up the walls 
and then they would put like supports through the wall through the through the width of the walls to keep it upright then they would put up the curtains the covering they would put in all the pieces the ark and the menorah everything in the right place and then they would you know for however long they were meant to stay in one place they would stay there and they would worship god utilizing this mishkan this portable temple the portable sanctuary until god gave the signal for them to move by the way parenthetically what was the signal for them to start moving so it says that there was a cloud that rested over them this wasn't a rain cloud that's a negative sign this was like a a holy cloud a divine presence cloud and as long as the cloud was hovering over the camp they knew to stay when the cloud lifted and it started moving moses said to the nearest taxi driver hey follow that cloud that's a joke but that's that was the signal for them <laughs> to start moving. Uh, Yaakov writes, a cloud of glory, perhaps. The answer is yes, indeed, the cloud of glory. So was this Mishkan considered the first prefab? Yes, the Mishkan was definitely a prefab, although it was it's, it literally cut into pieces, portable pieces. And by the way, in case you're wondering, when they, when they traveled, what they did was they disassembled the Mishkan. They disassembled it down to the boards and the beams and the sockets and the curtains, folded everything up. And then they loaded onto wagons. There were a specific, the Torah discusses six wagons that, that carried everything. Um, and the Levites, the Levim, used to carry some um, on their shoulders. In other words, they would carry some by hand. The rest of it went on the wagons. The stuff was very heavy. They had oxen. Or, yeah, I think it was oxen that would that would carry the wagons. Uh, sorry, that would, that would uh, uh, pull the wagons. And that's the way it was done. So all of this is just a bit of a context, uh, some context to understand what we just read. Because when they would travel, right, when they were, when they started to move, so again, when the ark was moving, oh, and one more thing, the ark would always go ahead of the procession. The ark led the travels. So when they, when they, when they, when they moved in the, in the, in, in the desert, in the wilderness, so the ark would go first. The ark was not, I have more information to share. I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. The ark would never go in a wagon. The ark was always carried on the shoulders that had poles. And they, the, the Levites carried the ark on their shoulders. And the ark always went ahead. And so when the ark went out, again, as the verse says, Moses would say, and the quote is interesting, Arise, O Lord, may your foes be scattered, and may those who hate you flee from you. It's kind of like the ark was the enemy dissipator, right? It, like, it went ahead, and it, it was like, shoo all ye foes, shoo all you haters, and that was uh, that was the message that Moses would say. And we say the same thing every time we open up the ark. We say, uh, yeah, we say every time we open up the ark, we say the same thing. Even though our ark is different than that ark, it's still called an ark, the ark that we have, the Aron. And it houses the Torah. That ark housed the tablets of the, uh, um, God's you know, handiwork, the, the two tablets that contain the Ten Commandments. Ours houses the Torah scrolls. But when we open up the ark, we say the same thing. Now, if you look at text one carefully, you notice that there's two descriptions. One is foes, or, or two subjects of uh, that, that Moses was directing um, toward. Number one, foes, and number two, haters, right? So there's the oyev, and then there's the sone. There's the, there's the foe, the enemy, and then there is the hater. And one might wonder, it seems a little bit redundant, why would Moses say, may your foes be scattered, and may those who hate you flee from you? I mean, isn't that the same thing? What's the difference between a foe and a hater? They seem like the same thing. And so we have some commentaries that differentiate between what uh, between foes and haters, i.e. enemies and haters. And that is text number two. Toba, please read text number two. This is going to give us a little bit of uh, more direction in this understanding. A sonne is one who harbors hatred in their heart and does not reveal it. And Oyev reveals their hatred. And Oyev actively seems seeks to harm their enemy. A sonne rejoices when their enemy is harmed, but doesn't necessarily act if they do harm. Instead, they guard the hatred in their heart. Thank you. So here you have um, one form, one rabbi, one, one commentary's understanding of the, difference, of the difference between a sonne and an oyev. Again, a hater and an enemy. And so let's break it down. We're going to go paragraph by paragraph and break it down to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So the first point is that a hater is someone who has hatred in their heart, but doesn't reveal it. In other words, it's kind of like secret, a secret hater. <laughs> Whereas the Oyev, the enemy, 
they let you know that, that they're, they're your enemy. As you don't have to guess whether someone's your enemy, whether someone hates you. I mean, God forbid, but that that already you don't know. And then the, in the next paragraph, he, he doubles down on this and he says the Oyev actively seeks to harm the enemy. In other words, it's an active harm. It's an active harm. Whereas the Sone, whereas the hater rejoices internally when something bad happens, but is not necessarily doing something harmful. It's kind of in the heart. So if you if you took just this one commentary's kind of um, understanding and the way the way he divides the two terms, again, just break it down. A hater is someone who harbors hatred in their heart. They're not act. They're not necessarily doing something about it. They're not acting on it. Um, you might not even know that they hated you. They might only secretly be happy. God forbid if something bad happens, but they might not actually do something. What about an enemy? An enemy, you know, when someone's an enemy. An enemy is someone who is actively on a campaign to take someone down, to harm, God forbid, etc. So the enemy is clear. The hater is internal. That's one way of understanding it. But today, notwithstanding what we just read, we're, we're going to go in a bit of a different direction. And actually, you know, based on what we just said, if I were to ask you the question based on the comments uh, of, of text two, which is worse? Which is worse, the enemy or the hater? What do you think? Which is worse, the enemy or the hater? Seems like the, the hater would be. Sorry, you the said the, so, mom. You say the enemy. I think an enemy because there's actual physical harm. There's an actual you know, campaign you know, against. Right. Okay. On, on, uh, right in front of you. Right in front of you, Dr. Maxi. You no, said but the hater because the enemy. You know they're your enemy. They're in your face saying, "I'm going to do you in." The right. hater will use ways where they subtly undermine you or cause you harm, but you won't ever know it. Right. It's kind of like, which one do you want? Do you want to know that someone's your enemy or do you want to maybe find out at some later point, maybe when it's too late? Because that, right. So, so on the one hand, the one who just doesn't like you, all right, it's internal. Maybe it's not so harmful as the enemy. On the other hand, that could be more insidious because they don't let they don't show their cards. So again, you could look at it both ways, but I actually want to go in another direction, a little bit of a different direction, and say the following. There's another way to understand this: that that an enemy is someone who, on a very practical level, is engaged in a campaign to tear you down. The enemy is someone who's, you know, they they're 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 working against you. The hater, so that is what we might call a pragmatic foe, whereas the hater is an ideological foe. In other words, the hater is not someone who's working against you. The hater hates. And it's it's a little bit of a, it, it's not only is it internal so that it, it, um, it's not revealed and then it could be more dangerous, but it's also, there's another layer. What, what I'm adding a different layer to what was what we just read in text two, and that is that the, the hater it's about, it's an ideology as opposed to, look, someone just might be opposed to someone or something. I don't like it. I'm opposed to it. But it doesn't mean that you hate. It means you are opposed to it. You could be in a, you can be in opposition. Like I can disagree with someone's position. I can disagree with someone's wh wh whatever. That's, an, that, that's a foe. But a hater that's something else. That's even deeper. Hater means I hate. Means the the the, the ideology is something that 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 is that is being contested and challenged. It's like an ideological. It's like a a core um, uh, um, uh, and and antagonism as opposed to a pragmatic antagonism. Again, we could ask the question which one is worse. But framed in this new way that I'm framing it, one is more I guess surface, whereas the other one not only emanates, but it also hits in a deeper sense. And so if we understand it this way, what Moses is saying, as the ark would travel, he would say, again, just to quote the verse, just to make sure I'm quoting it accurately, not paraphrasing it too much. So Moses would say, if we look back at text one, arise, O Lord, and may your foes be scattered. In other words, the obvious enemies, those that are pragmatically against you, may they be scattered. And may those who hate you, the ones that you don't know about, well, I mean, God knows everything, but the ones that we might not know about, the ones that hate, not only are opposed to, but hate you, flee from you. 
which evokes the following question. I understand that somebody might be opposed to God, right? Somebody might be opposed to God. Why are they opposed to God? I don't know. Maybe uh, it's you know, Torah mitzvot is too taxing, too burdensome. So, you know, I don't like it. Or not, I don't like it, but I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm opposed to it. It's too, it's too much. It's too daunting. It's too difficult. It's too pervasive. Whatever. It's. But, but who are these haters that, that Moses was speaking of? Who hates God? Why would you hate God? So I want to share with you the following interpretation. It's a powerful interpretation, and it's one that Rashi cites. Now, Rashi, of course, is the foremost biblical commentary. Rashi takes the verse out of its simple meaning, even though, by the way, for the record, Rashi is the commentary by that, that who by design explains pshat, the simple meaning of the verse, and yet... Here it seems like he deviates a little bit from it, but he learns that this is the simple meaning. Take a look at text number three. Text number three is very important, very powerful. Um, Rashi comments on this verse that we read, those who hate you. What does that mean? Who are the haters? Meaning those who hate the people of Israel. For anyone who hates the people of Israel hates the one who spoke and the world came into being. Mm -hmm. And then Rashi cites a proof text from Psalms as it says, those who hate you have raised their heads. And who are those who hate you? Those who, as the verse continues, plot deviously against your nation, i.e. the Jewish people, the people of Israel. So Rashi says the following. Moses is saying, uh, turning back to text one, may your foes be scattered. God's foes, may they be scattered. And may those who hate you, hate who? The Jewish people, flee from you. And what's the connection? Why are those who hate you? Why is that a reference to the Jewish people? It's because those who hate the Jewish people are really hating God. And that's what Rashi is saying. Rashi is saying that God's... So again, there are those that are that are opposed to godly things. All right, are those that don't do it? Fine, that's one thing. But those who hate, who's hating God? No, 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 we're not talking about God hate you. We're talking about Jew hatred, God's people hatred. And that's what Moses was referencing which again is opening up our eyes to a deeper understanding of what hatred of, 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 of Jews is about. It's not about anything but really God hatred. Jew hatred is, and that's what Rashi is saying, that when, when, when Moses talks about those who hate God, he's referencing those who hate the Jewish people who, who by definition are hating the Jewish people because they hate God. Now, one could ask the simple question, and this is what we're going to get into in the next part of this class. One might ask the question, one second, who says anyone, who says the anti-Semite hates God? Maybe the anti-Semite hates the Jew. That's it. <laughs> maybe it's just about the Jew. Yeah. Who says it's about God? Right? Maybe the anti-Semite just, maybe, uh, you know, there's so many different reasons, rationales. If you ask somebody why anti-Semitism, they'll tell you a whole host of reasons, right? They'll tell you about ancient stories about, uh, you know, Christianity and and. And then the founder of Christianity, they'll tell you stories about, I don't know, about Jews being, uh, who knows what? Who says it's about God? So what we're going to do now is examine the alleged reasons for anti-Semitism and see what indeed is behind these reasons and do they hold water? I'm going to, I'm going to do some readings over here. So take a look as I share the screen, but you also have it in front of you here in person. Take a look at text number four. Okay, text number four is, is from an ancient text. Um, there was a Roman historian and philosopher, Cornelius Tacitus. So he writes the following. He, he talks about an old Egyptian um, tale or legend. Not a legend as in a not true legend, but an old Egyptian narrative. Now, this dates back thousands of years, predates the beginnings and the origins of Christianity. Again, many have posited that the reason, the source of anti-Semitism, the source of Jew hatred goes back to the beginnings of Christianity and to the crucifixion. However, what we're seeing, what we're about to see in text four is that that, that can't be the case because there are literally earlier texts that speak of uh, a Jew hatred as well as the various anti-Semitic tropes that unfortunately have uh, have been pervasive since time immemorial. Take a look at text four. Look at this. I'll read this. 
once during a plague in Egypt, which caused bodily disfigurement, King Bacchus approached the oracle of Ammon and asked for a remedy, whereupon he was told to purge his kingdom and to transport this race. I'll uh, let you guess what this race refers to. Okay, I'm not going to let you guess. This is the Jewish people, right? This race into other lands, since it was hateful to the gods. By the way, you see the twist on the Egyptian Exodus story, right? There were plagues in the land, and the reason why was because there was this uh, uh, this hated um, nation. And they had to purge this nation. Okay, so the Hebrews were searched out and gathered together, just in the case we were wondering who we're talking about. Um, then being abandoned in the desert, while all, uh, while all others lay idle and weeping, only one of their exiles, Moses by name, warned them not to hope for help from gods or men, for they were deserted by both, but to trust to themselves. The Jews regard as profane all that we hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. They first chose to rest on the seventh day, but after a time they were led by the charms of indolence to give over the seventh year as well to inactivity. <laughs> All right, you see the tropes here that are coming out. Like Laziness. That. The other customs of the Jews are base and abominable and owe their persistence to their depravity. For the worst rascals among other peoples, renouncing their ancestral religions, always kept sending tribute and con contributions to Jerusalem, thereby increasing the wealth of oh, the Jews. God. It's unbelievable, right? Again, the Jews are extremely loyal toward one another and always ready to show compassion. But toward every other people... They feel only hate and enmity. Now, I got to tell you this. Oh, you know, if you would read this today, you'd be like, okay, yeah, I told that sounds. And I'll go through it. If, you know, might as well just go through it like blow by blow and see the various tropes that we can identify. But, you know, if, if you and I would read this, we'd be like, okay, yeah, it's like it's it's the fairly modern uh, uh, stereotypes of anti-Semitism. But know this, this goes back over 2,000 years. Again, it predates uh, the, the legend uh, in, in, in Egypt, et cetera, predates Christianity. This is something that is extremely old. And if you look at if you look at um, at, at, at the anti-Semitism here or at the at the um, the prejudice, the first thing we encounter. OK, you know, what, let me ask. Let me ask you guys to come up with it. What's the first anti-Semitic trope that we find in this text? What's the first thing? The Jews are bad because. Finish the sentence. The gods don't like them. The gods don't like them. Good. Continue the sentence. The Jews are bad because they're, they're in the lazy. Yeah, they're lazy. lazy. They're lazy. They don't work. Good. The Jew, they have the Sabbath, they have the sabbatical year. Oh, lazy. The Jews are hated because the Jews are no good because. Finish the sentence. They're wealthy. They're wealthy. They take money. From, they take money from they others. Take money from, take others. money from others. Good. What else? The Jews are bad because they're secretive and 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 stick together. They stick together. They're secretive, right? They're very much um, uh, tribal or whatever it is, but yeah. about themselves, not about anyone else. Oh my god! Yeah, this is it's it's like this is like a best of uh, or a worst of. But I think you guys, I think the first one also is powerful. That Jews are behind all the world's problems. Right? There's a plague in Egypt. And why is there a plague in Egypt? Because of the Jews. Uh, that's the first one. God hates them. No, that's why there's a plague. Oh. But I'm saying the first thing is to blame oh, oh, oh. to blame like natural, you know, disasters on the Jews. Right? Like, look, we know this happened during the other like plagues and 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 the middle, you know, uh I don't know, the Black Plague, whatever it was, where Jews were blamed. And here we have this template. We have literally the playbook. There's a plague in Egypt. Again, this whole story is above a mice is, is made up. But whatever, there's a plague in Egypt. And, and why is it? Because of the Jews. Why is it? Because of the Jews. Because God hates the Jews. Because God, the gods hate the Jews, et cetera. Yeah, so Jews are the, the source of all the problems. Jews are hated by God. They're also hated by men. Don't, don't, uh, don't miss that one. Don't hope for, from help for God, from God or men. In other words, uh, Jews are hated by people, by the gods. They're deserted. They're lazy. They and, and then you have this like broad sweeping declaration. They regard as profane all that we hold sacred. Not like something. Not like we're different in some areas. Everything we like, they hate. 
everything we hate, they like everything. Everything, all, right? They permit all that we abhor, everything. Okay, all right, there you go. Um, I think we covered it. I mean, that was like six, seven, eight, nine different points that are being made. I mean, overall, this is like, Look at any anti-Semitic text, and anti-Semitic ramblings. I, and I don't have to, listen, I'm, I'm not actually suggesting that you do this, but any anti-Semitic thread, any comment section of anything, you re start reading it and someone lays into the Jewish people, you will see some version of the above, right? Jews are controlling this, that, or the other. Jews are, are, are have a secret cabal. Right. Jews are behind all the world's problems. Jews caused COVID. I mean, all, all of this stuff, Jews caused 9-11. You, you, you have the same, the version of this repeating throughout history. I mean, you have six, seven different angles on it, just cut and paste. To 2024, we're talking about over 2,000 years, 2,200 years ago, 2024. And you have the same, the same anti-Semitic Was trust. this after the Jews left Egypt? The story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, so Tacitus writes this down in the first century of the Common Era. Oh, okay, okay. So but he's writing this down from books and 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 legends. or, or legend, uh, but written accounts written from account. the from ancient from well from from Egyptian society and Egyptian writings that predate him in the first century. So that's why it's not first century post right. the emergence of Christianity. No, no, this no. is this is quoting you know several hundred years prior to that. So I think the point is that it, it's it's. That that these Jewish that these hate uh, um, tropes are very um, very old and very ancient. Now, the question that we might ask, and it's a question certainly that that begs um, looking into, is what's going on? I mean, this this sounds crazy. What you take a people and you just make up stuff. I mean, the, the evil of the evil there against everything that we hold dear, and they're for everything that we abhor, and and behind all the world's problems, and if there's ever a plague or whatever it is, it's you want me to, uh, yeah. What, then, then it's um, it's blame blame the Jews. Like what what well, is going on here? What bothers me is they say that the Jews are depraved. I mean, that, that that's just like that's it. They're no across the board, right? They're, yeah, that's it. The primary question. Everything else follows on this. Right? Everything else is not kosher because their Jews are depraved. Right. That's a label that just that's it. Yeah. So, so the question, yeah, and um, yeah, saying that um, you know the Jews are exporting our wealth and they're supporting a foreign yes. nation. That's what the Russians said about the Alter Rebbe. And um, oh, on a personal God. note, whenever somebody just starts loading up the criticism and it's a whole criticism campaign, oh, they got their feelings hurt and they're throwing a temper tantrum in there. And mm -hmm. they don't have the honesty because they got their feelings hurt to actually tell you what the real truth is. But actually, people, everybody believes, most, uh, some people believe it, some people that understand human nature don't believe all the insults, but they're telling you that none of those are the real reason. You know, most smart people right. will tell you none of those are the real reason. Just to, let me explain what you're saying. What you're saying is if someone gives you more than one reason, you know that none of those reasons, typically, None of them are the real reason. Someone's like, exactly. let me give seven reasons why. You're like, okay, all right. So you don't even know why. You just know that you hate. That's what you're saying. And that's exactly. that's a powerful thing to remember. Now, let's look at, because you mentioned Russia, uh, that works perfectly with our next text. Let's take a look at the text. Five. I want to read this one as well. This comes from Rabbi Menachem Zamba. And I think it's really important to check out his bio because, as you'll see, he passed. he died in 1943. He was actually murdered by the Nazis uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the famous Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So here is a man who, uh, a, a, an, an absolute Torah scholar and, and a, a, um, a very uh, prominent rabbi who met his end at the hands of horrific Jew hatred, at the hands of the Nazis. Text number five, here's what he writes. There are those, and, and, and you can see his depth of insight when it comes to anti-Semitism. There are those who seek to identify legitimate causes for the hatred of Jews. However, reality has shown that there is no legitimate reason. Anti-Semitism has no justifiable cause. The haters simply choose to hate God's people. This is demonstrated by the fact that Jews are hated for being capitalists, 
and also for being socialists. <laughs> they're hated because they're overly ambitious and sharp-minded and also because they're burdensome and parasitic. Mm. They're hated because they're too religious and conservative and also because they advance progressive and secular ideas. The reasons for this hatred are consistently contradictory and have not an ounce of logic behind them. This is a text that I always go back to in my own heart and mind. Because here you have a rabbi who was staring the, 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 the Nazi regime in the eye. He lived in the ghetto. He lived in the Warsaw ghetto. He died in the hands of the Nazis in the Warsaw ghetto uprising. This was a man who had an insight, a rabbi who had a tremendous insight. You know, they hate us for being socialists. They hate us for being capitalists. They hate us for being successful. They hate us for being not successful. They hate us for integrating too much. They hate us for being separate too much. It's the reasons are always contradictory. It's like Jew hatred is a constant throughout time. If you look at eras in history, there's about a pogrom or an expulsion every 30, 40, 50 years, historically speaking. And every time there's a different reason. It's like, oh, because you're too this. No, you're too that. No, you're too this. And as Yaakov said before, when you have contradictory reasons, what you know is none of the above. It's none of the above. It's like, what? If only we fit in better, they would love us. Do you know what the Jews in Germany before World War II tried to do? Do you know what Jewish life looked like in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s? By and large, the Jews in Germany were highly integrated. Highly integrated. The whole reform movement began at that point in time, in the in the mid to late 1800s in Germany, the intention was to fit in better, to be better neighbors. In fact, the whole movement's motto was be a German in the street and be a Jew at home. And how did, how, and, and, and where did it get them? Ah, the worst. It's like, oh, we're going to fit in. And then you know what the, what the haters say? Look at you, <laughs> trying to assimilate, trying to get into a site, trying to take us over from the inside. What do you mean? Scientists, musicians, artists, physicists, doctors, engineers, owners of factories. What do you mean? Army Jews, officers. Army officers, army Jews, officers. power, not the whole Germany, but we're very integrated into Germany. And it helped nothing. Not only did it not help, it was used against. So again, being separate, got to get rid of you. Being integrated, got to get rid of you. Being a capitalist, got to get rid of you. Being a socialist, got to get rid of you. At some point, this rabbi says, <laughs> what do you want? It's obviously none of these reasons. It's obviously not. Let's continue. There's more text. Let's continue. Okay? Let's take a look at the next text. This is text number Six, just to kind of echo the absurdity of the contradictions, the Midrash, now this is a much older text. The Midrash, this is dating back to, I don't know. Um, oh no, look at this, from the year 1519. It's a later, it's a latter day Midrash. So this is from the 16th century. But take a look, a Jew passed before Hadrian. Hadrian was one of the Roman uh, emperors. A Jew passed before Hadrian and greeted him. The emperor asked him, who are you? He answered, a Jew. He said, a Jew should pass before Hadrian and greet him. Take him and cut off his head. How dare you, Jew, greet me? Another Jew was passing by and seeing what had happened, did not greet the emperor. The emperor asked him, who are you? He answered, a Jew. He said, a Jew should pass before Hadrian and not greet him. Take him and cut off his head. His <laughs> senator said to him, we don't know what you're doing. One was killed for greeting you. One was killed for not greeting you. He replied, you want to tell the king what to do about those he hates? <laughs> I, and I'm laughing. It's horrible. I, I, I don't know if it's a real story if it's a, or if it's a if it's if it's a um, kind of a, a parable, as it were. The point is that you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And the point is, it's not about what you do or what you don't do. It's, it's all about hate. And hate is ultimately irrational. And hate will take on the one constant about hate is the hate. But what, what the alleged um, uh, rationale for the hate, that's changed. But it doesn't, it's like, 
Oh, you were too nice. You were too integrated. You're gone. Oh, you didn't say hi. You're too separate. You're gone. I mean, come on. It's like, so, so the hatred says, don't tell me, don't tell me what to do about, about those that I hate. In other words, it's not about saying hi or not saying hi. It's just about the hatred. That is the core of the situation. Now, we got to read the next text. This is Rabbi uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Many of you know Rabbi, uh, who Rabbi Sachs was. He passed away um, a few years ago in 2020. Um, he had cancer. He was suffering terribly. Um, a tremendous loss to the Jewish people. He was the chief rabbi of England. Tremendous scholar, philosopher, order, writer. He has a way of words and a way of framing ideas that is really powerful. If you ever want to read something highly intelligent, uh, Jewishly, right? There's a Jew, a highly intelligent of our Torah. Just look up Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, our, like look, look up his words of Torah. Really, really beautiful. So take a look at text number seven. And, and this is one of the most, I don't know, I think in modern times, one of the most famous articulations of anti-Semitism and, and really the uh, the horrors of anti-Semitism of our generation. And, and I need to mention this. It explains a lot about what's going on in Israel right now. Text number seven. Anti-Semitism, he writes, is not an ideology, a coherent set of beliefs. It is, in fact, an endless stream of contradictions. And by the way, what he means by not an ideology, he means it's not coherent. You can't support it with, with, with facts. Okay, let's continue. The best way of understanding it is to see it as a virus. Viruses attack the human body, but the body itself has an immensely sophisticated defense, the human immune system. How then do viruses survive and flourish? By mutating. <laughs> Anti-Semitism mutates and in so doing defeats the immune systems set up by cultures to protect themselves against hatred. Most people at most times feel a residual guilt at hating the innocent. Therefore, anti-Semitism has always had to find legitimation in the most prestigious source of authority at any given time. I need to stop for a moment and explain what he's saying. What he's saying here is, that anti-Semitism is not an ideology, it's a virus. It's not predicated on an idea or a philosophy, it's predicated on hate, pure and simple. As what why is it why is he calling it a virus? Because just like a virus mutates to get around defenses, the ideology or so-called ideology of, of anti-Semitism mutates over the ages in order to get around the checks and balance the systems that societies put up so as not to allow hatred to pass by their gates. How does anti-Semitism, how is it that in the United States of America, right, you have anti-Semitism and people espousing anti-Semitic things? How, we don't tolerate that. How on campus, let's just let's put all the cards on the table. How is it possible that on college campuses over the last few months of the school year, things were allowed to be said and demonstrated and done when against any other group or race, it would not be tolerated under the guise of free speech. You just could not say these things. And why you get, why for Jews was it allowed? You know what the answer? Stay tuned. Let's continue reading. Look at what he writes. Look at what he writes. In the first centuries of the Common Era, and again in the Middle Ages, this was religion. Again, what's this? The authority of the time was religion. That is why Judophobia took the form of religious doctrine. And what he means over there is that Judaism, you know, Christ killers, et cetera, that that is the problem. So it was couched in religious terms. When religion was the king of societies, then what was the problem with Jews? The religion. So look, we don't hate. We don't hate. But someone who's against the religion, someone who, that we can hate. Okay. In the 19th century, religion had lost prestige. And the supreme authority was now science. Racial anti-Semitism was duly based on two pseudosciences, so-called Darwinism, the idea that in society as in nature, the strong survive by eliminating the weak, and the so-called scientific study of race. In other words, in simple terms, what happened in Germany, right? What happened with the Holocaust? The Jews, it wasn't about being the wrong religion. It was about being the wrong race, because religion is not the authority, the supreme authority of the time. It's, it's, it's science. Oh, science, you're the wrong science. <laughs> I mean, would love to protect you, but Darwinism, the study of race, we got to get rid of, we got to get rid of the, the weak or the inferior races in order to allow the strong races to thrive and survive. So 
sorry, but we got to do what we got to do. By the late 20th century, and here's where it gets really, really poignant. By the late 20th century, and, and okay, and into the 21st century, science had lost its prestige, having given us the power to destroy life on earth. Today, the supreme source of legitimacy is human rights. That is why Jews or the Jewish state, and I want to focus on that in a moment, are accused of the five primal sins against human rights. Racism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, attempted genocide, and crimes against humanity. Exactly. This is amazing. Yeah, How pres- seven and look at that. In 2007, he wrote this, as Toba's pointing exactly. out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally prophetic. Because if you look at what Israel is being accused of and his, what he posited in this and in many talks that he gave and many other writings is that the, the, the anti-Israel sentiment, people are like, no, no problem with Jews. The only problem we have is with Israel, that that is the mutated virus of anti-Semitism because you know you can't stand up and say, I hate Jews. The world wouldn't allow you to say that, so you don't say that. A virus mutates. You don't run into a defense. You don't run head first into that which is going to block you. You do an end around. So you say, no, 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 no. I no, I love Jews. What do you mean? We love Jews. Israel. Okay, Israel's a problem. Why? Human rights. Why human rights? Because that's the king of the era. Because you can't argue against human rights. So suddenly, who? So when religion is big, who's the greatest enemy to religion? The Jews. When science is big and racist, who's the greatest enemy against science? The Jews. When human rights is king, who's the greatest threat to human rights? The Jews. You see what's going on? It's the same thing. It's the same story. Capitalists, socialists, it's the same story. The narrative keeps on changing. The one truth remains, and that is we need a pretext. We need a pretext. And so today, I'm just going to put it back on the screen, and you can read it for yourself, and you can allow it to land however you wish to have it land for you, the Jewish state, Jews are the Jewish state, and it's interchangeable, right? It's like we pretend it's not interchangeable. I, I don't know which side pretends it's not, but the bottom line is the same thing, right? Five primal sins against hu- human rights. And this is 2007. This is 17 years ago. He writes racism. Okay, yeah. Check. Apartheid. Check. Um, when I say check, I mean this is the accusations out there, right? Ethnic cleansing. Check. Attempted genocide. Check. Crimes against humanity. Check. This it, is it. It's, it's all brought in the in the ICC. A hundred percent. All of these points. A hundred percent. And it's like, look, we have no problem with Jews. Happens to be that Israel is the one nation on earth. We're not going to look at any other nation. But look at let's look at Israel. Israel is unfortunately the great. This is what they say. Just don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This is what what the claim is that Israel is the greatest violator. And and Rabbi Sachs is saying. You know why this is the problem now? Because that's the big deal. And this is how anti-Semitism mutates. When human rights, whatever is the champion cause, the Jews will always find themselves miraculously and magically on the other side or the worst of the worst against that, whatever that cause or that that or that or ideology is. And, and again, he's not saying that it's true. On the contrary, he's saying this is how the... Uh, the virus of anti-Semitism has mutated. The message is, obviously, what we're trying to say is, uh, <laughs> don't fall for it. This is this is the uh, this is the guise of anti-Semitism. It's not legitimate. It's the guise. Is anyone perfect? Is any country? Of course not. And this is not, by the way, this is not a class about Israel and about what's going on right now in Gaza. This is not a class on that. This is a class on ancient Jew hatred and the different forms. That it takes. The point is that although many um, rationales have been given over the ages, so called rationales, we hate you because of X, we hate you because of Y, we hate you because of Z, we hate you because of this, we too much this or too little that, and it changes and it morphs and it, and it, and it, and it transmogrifies to quote Calvin and Hobbes right throughout the years. It, it, it does all of the above. The one constant is somehow Jews have a target on their back. And it's and it's uh, some better times, some worse times, but it seems to be the constant. And it begs the question, what is the real reason? It's not capitalism. It's not socialism. It's not wealth. It's not poverty. It's not integration. It's not 
it's not the separateness. It's not human rights. It's not religion, and it's not science. It's not race. It's not. It's not evolutionary science. So what is it? All of these are our pretexts. It's like, oh, look, oh, we got you now. What is the real reason? Now, I've spoken about this before, and we've gone into different angles on this at the core. And as we try to explore what is the soul, what is the root, what is the core of anti-Semitism, where does the hatred really come from? Not what are the excuses for the hatred. Where does it really come from? Tonight, we're going to go in an interesting angle. I already told you the angle, but let's uh, let's develop this. Oh, but before we do that, oh, one second, one second, one second. Oh, no, 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 we're good. No, we're, we're good. good. No, we're good. right on track. Yes. I thought I thought we had gone too far. We didn't go too far. Perfect. Now, let's take a look. Let's take a look at text number eight. Okay. And here is where Rabbi Ben Sion Shafir writes. Beautiful, um, uh, powerful um, characterization. The pattern that emerges is that there is no logical reason for anti-Semitism until you focus on the real cause, that the Jew represents Hashem. We are, and Hashem is God, right? We are Hashem's people. When the Gentile looks at a Jew, he sees Hashem, and that image is not always attractive to him. It's important to understand and to, to focus for a minute on what he's saying. What he's saying is that the Jewish people, everyone knows, right, the Jewish people represent God, God's people, God's chosen people. It's in everyone's Bible. Everyone's got, a, got the same copy of the Bible. Whatever religion you are, the, the Torah, the five books of Moses says the same thing. We know the story about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Exodus and Sinai and Ten Commandments. We know the story. The story is the same. It's, there's no different versions of that story in the Bible, depending on which religion you belong to whether it's Christianity or Islam or Judaism, it's the same core origin story. And that origin story talks about the Jewish people being God's people. And what this rabbi is writing, Rabbi Shafir is writing, is he's saying that when people look at a Jew, they're not only looking at the Jew, they're looking at who the Jew represents and who the Jew represents is God. And so they're looking at, I'm not saying they're looking at God or not calling a person God, but again, they're looking at what the Jew represents the symbolism or the representation. And that representation doesn't make everyone comfortable. Not about the individual, but about, but about the core concept. Because oftentimes, very oftentimes, people don't want to be faced with a higher authority, right? Um, Hebrew national hot dogs notwithstanding, right? Remember that commercial? We answered to a higher authority, right? Not everyone wants to answer to a higher authority. You know what's easier? To not have a higher authority. I once saw a letter, a beautiful letter, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, wrote to a scientist. Someone who's skeptical about God, faith. And apparently, at, we the letter to the Rebbe is not published. The letter the Rebbe wrote back is published. So apparently the guy wrote something, the scientist wrote that, you know, he's a man of science, scientist, and he doesn't, he doesn't operate on leaps of faith. Like, if it doesn't line up, if he can't, Prove it, you're not going to believe him. So you can't prove God, so he doesn't believe. It. The Rebbe writes back something along the lines of, have you ever flown in an airplane? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, how did you know it was safe to fly? How did you know? Did you inspect the plane? Did you interview the pilot? How do you know? Did you go to Boeing and inspect the motors? <laughs> By the way, Boeing had a massive... Uh, 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 call to Moses moment uh, today, or whatever they were taken to. Um, so Congress, they were the, the CEO had to stand before Congress that in uh, testify. He got, mm -hmm. got put himself in a lot. Anyway, that's that's a mess. Anyway, the point is, I saw that I read some stuff right before the class. Um, back to the story. Mm -hmm. The Rebbe writes, "How do you know the plane is safe to fly? How do you know? You don't know. It's a leap of faith. It's a leap of faith. You trust." You, 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 you believe, you trust that, yeah, there's always a leap of faith. You're always making a leap of faith. And so a person say, I don't make, I don't take leaps of faith. That's not, it's patently not true. You do take leaps of faith, but you pick and choose which leaps of faith you will take. Well, this one, there was science behind it. Which one? The airplanes? Airplane. Yeah. No, yeah, there's science behind airplanes flying. Yeah. But the question the Rebbe asked, specific. 
how do you know that this airplane, how do you know that this one, not that in general flying works, how do you know that this plane is fit to fly? How do you know that this pilot is qualified? You didn't speak, to, you didn't see even the pilot. You didn't, you didn't check credentials. You don't see his uh, documentation, nothing. You step on a plane, you strap into your seatbelt and you trust. Trust in what? I don't know. I trust that the manufacturer and that the inspectors and that the pilot and that- And that I they put the, enough fuel in the tank. Whatever, I, I trust, I trust. <laughs> my, my point is not not to trust. I'm not saying don't trust. I'm saying trust, but apply the trust also. Rebbe also wrote a letter. Um, so I remember reading a letter. He writes that, um, you know, the belief in, and he used that word, belief in evolution that, you know, because we don't have any scientific models that prove any evolution to the level of complexity that would produce what we have in life today. I mean, we've seen there's some measures of evolutionary, you know, biological evolution, uh, but not the level, advancement, but not to the level of to produce all this. So to say that this could happen is also a leap of faith like, through evolution. So you have now two options to choose that this was, you know, created intentionally, you know, by design, by a loving creator, or that this all kind of just happened. It reminds me of the story of Maimonides, who was having a debate with one of his fellow, I'm not, whatever, not, not a contemporary, but another philosopher at the time who wasn't a believer in God and who believed that everything was just, you know, just came to be. And this guy, they were, he was meeting in his office, and this fellow, this other guy, walks out of the office for a moment, Maimonides, Rambam, right? looks at his desk, at the other guy's desk. He sees that he had started like a poem and hadn't finished. He finishes writing the poem, takes the ink inkwell and spills it at the corner of the page. And this guy comes back and he sees that my money has finished the poem. So, oh, thank you so much. You finished the poem. It's so good. It's the perfect ending. And he says, I didn't do anything. I spilled the ink and it somehow formed all these letters. And the guy's like, are you kidding me? There's no way that randomly it could spit, ink could spill and perfectly form exquisitely the exact thing that needed to be in the exact place at the right time, in the right line, the right letters, the right form. And Maya says, and what do you believe in, my friend? What do you actually, what do you believe in? And my point of this is to say that the reason why the Rebbe says uh, uh, people go that way is because there are no strings attached. If you believe in a random universe, if you believe in evolution, if you believe that there's no intentionality in this, then you're off the hook. Right. You, are, you can choose to be as good or as not good as you want because there is no purpose. There is no higher calling. There is no intention. There is no meaning, ultimately. It's all what we choose to create. If you believe in a higher power, if you believe in a creator, someone who created God, not someone like a per but if you believe in a being in a higher power that created all this for a purpose, guess what? You've got a purpose. There's accountability now. Yes. Now you got to show up. Who wants accountability? <laughs> Behind door number one, do whatever you want. Behind door number two, strings. Door number one sounds like a great option, right? I don't have to do anything. Whatever I do is better than better than I had to do because you know I choose to be a good moral person. I didn't have to. That when when the when the nations of the world historically look at the Jew, they see this word called God, and not everybody likes it. Too many strings. Too many. Str I don't like this. A higher power, a higher authority. I have to answer to something. I have to. I will have to stand in account at the end of my life before my Creator. I don't like it. And if you represent it, I, I want to like kill you. God through killing the Jew. Yeah. Mm. Let's read some more text inside. Text number nine says the midrash. Said Moses, master of, the uh, master of the universe, had we been Gentiles, idol worshippers, or deniers of the mitzvot, they would neither hate us nor persecute us. It is only on account of the Torah and mitzvot that, that you gave us that they hate us. You know the word, you know Mount Sinai? Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of the mountain, right? Mount Sinai? We've all heard it. Sinai, Sinai. You know what that word sounds like? Sinai. Hate. Sina hate. There's a comment that says, why is it called Mount Sinai? Sina, Sinai? Sina. It's because of Sinai that they hate us. 
not because the Jews say a chosen nation. We got no because of what we represent, a higher authority, a higher, not just a higher calling, accountability. Yes. Giving the world a moral conscience, conscience, or a guilty conscience. And who wants that? And who wants that? Text number 10. Text number 10. Here's what the Rebbe says. Circling all the way back to the beginning. Rashi explains that those who hate you means those who hate the people of Israel. Remember when Moses said when the ark was moving, right? God, may God disperse those who hate you, the haters. And he said, who hates God? What's wrong with God? No, it's not God. You don't, you don't hate God necessarily. You hate, well, I mean, but it's channeled, manifest through hatred of the Jewish people. Because, back inside, because a deep-seated hatred of the one who spoke and the world came into being is indeed not prevalent, but those who hate the people of Israel automatically hate the one. I, I feel like I'm not reading this correct. Let me start again. Rashi explains that those who hate you means those who hate the people of Israel. Because a deep-seated a deep seated hatred of the one who spoke and the world came into being is indeed not prevalent. But those who hate the people of Israel automatically hate the one who spoke and the world came into being. In other words, Jew hatred is, in fact, God hatred. Says Rabbi Elisha Greenbaum, text 11a, the age-old struggle between Jew and Jew hater is a misnomer. I remember visiting the Nazi, the Nazi death camp, Dachau, how infuriating it was to see at the crematoria the large placard dedicating the site to those who died in the fight against Nazism. The moral might be somewhat appropriate for the political opponents of the regime who suffered and died there, but my grandfather's uncle, cousins, and thousands of other martyrs didn't die fighting anything. As far as they were concerned, they were happy to lead private lives before Hitler and his henchmen came looking for them. Determined a struggle between innocent victim and executioner is as inappropriate as ascribing modern-day society's effort to protect themselves from suicide bombers a, quote, cycle of violence. The struggle is not between our enemies and ourselves. Rather, God's antagonists attack us as the pawns in their battle against righteousness and godliness. Jew hatred is so ingrained and pervasive that no logical or rational explanation for this phenomenon can possibly be attached other than to define it as the wicked man's eternal struggle against divinity. That line in the concentration camp dedicated to those who died in their fight against Nazism as if they were fighting as if the Jews were fighting against Nazism. What? They were just living Jewish lives. They weren't fighting against anything. They were murdered. Would you write that at Nova? To those who died in the fight against, against, uh, against terrorism? They died at a concert. They were fighting. They were running. They weren't fighting. They weren't fighting. The Jews in Germany weren't fighting. There's no fighting. It's a one-way fight. A one-way fight of people who don't like to see into their own souls, who don't want to see a moral, a higher moral calling and a moral compass. Yeah, they think this was a fair fight. Text 11b. If they're not fighting us, but fighting God are only viable. Oh, so what do we do? One second. So what do we do about this? So now we know it's not about being more socialist or more capitalist. It's not about becoming wealthy or becoming less wealthy. It's not about integrating more or separating more. It's not about any of that. It's just about being identified with God. So now what do we do? Right? Do we unidentify with God? Text 11b. If they're not fighting us, but fighting God, are only viable responses to live and act like Jews, no matter the provocation. When it becomes apparent that their hatred toward us is predicated on our special relationship with God, then it becomes God's responsibility to defend himself from his opponents and enemies and come to our rescue, freeing us to resume our historic mission of representing godliness to the world. I'm waiting. What it means is, and this is powerful, I think we're going to end with this text, and I'm just going to wrap it up. But this, there's one more text, but it's all it's all along the same lines. Look, if we define anti-Semitism, and we are tonight defining it as people fighting, attempting to reject, attempting to push away, attempting to silence God in the world as represented by the Jewish people, it doesn't matter how religiously observant, how overtly Jewy the Jew is. 
The Jew by essence represents what they represent. It's not about, oh, so look, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't look Jewish. I'm not doing Jewish things. The anti-Semite doesn't care what you're doing, cares who you are. I think Jonathan Sachs once said that uh, while Hitler hunted down every Jew with hate, no matter who, no matter what, right? The Lubavitcher Rebbe hunted, not hunted, but see, sought out every Jew yeah. with love, no matter who, no matter what. It's like the Jews, the Jew that's hated is not because they look a certain way. It's because who they are, it's, it's, it's essential identity. And so therefore, we now have a choice. Try to further deny that identity. It's not, not going so to work. Right? You, you deny who you are. Again, Hitler took a quarter Jew. It wasn't even like... It wasn't, what, uh, uh, he didn't go to synagogue and go after Jews that were davening three times a day. That's not who we went after. Right? So, so that for, for some, some to say, okay, so if they're going after God, so then how do I get rid of God? That's not the answer. That's just compounding the problem. Because you know what? The person that hates the Jew, that hates God... Is trying to get rid of God. And if you're saying, yeah, I'm also trying to get rid of God. I agree with you. You know, that's only going to create more anti-Semitism. Are you with me? You think you're placating the anti-Semite? All you're doing is feeding into the narrative that God is not good, that God is right. And then like, okay, so then we're on the same page here. So now let's, let's, let's double down. Let's, let's go at let's, let's more hate. The solution is more Jewish pride and more embracing a godly, a divine mission. And what is the divine mission? What is the godly mission over here? To make the world a better place. To make the world a kinder, gentler, uh, spiritual, godly, divine place. More Torah study, more mitzvah doing, more chesed, kindness in the world, more good deeds in the world. Less selfish things and more selfless things. That's at the core of Judaism. That's at the core of God's call to humanity. Read the Ten Commandments. What's it about? Being a good person. Being a good person. Not killing, not stealing, protecting uh, family values, etc. Belief in one God, observing the Shabbat, which acknowledges that that there is a higher power, um, uh, honoring your parents, right? Hey, mom, right? So it's all about, right? It's all about that's that's what it's about being a good, being a mensch. So someone says, "No, I hate God, and I want to get rid of the Jewish people." The solution is not running away from that. The solution is leaning into Jewish identity, leaning into a higher call. And when we do that, as the rabbi just wrote over there in the text that we just read, 11b, when we do that, then indeed we have the blessing. And please, God, as Toba mentioned, may we see that blessing manifest where God will make the enemies, as, as, as it were, scatter and flee and dissipate. And uh, that happens when we live up to our end of, uh, of the mission. Look, to, to give in to hate, that doesn't help. It's not going to help. To stand up against hate, yes. And how do we stand up against hate? By leaning into who we really are. If we are the God squad, then let's just be it. Let's just do it. Nice. Let's just do it. If we represent divine values in the world, then just do it. Do it. Be a light unto the nations. Be a shining example to your family and friends and community. Be a mensch. Be an activist. Be a leader in good causes. Be the one that rallies the troops. To, to do more good in the world, the good in the neighborhood, create neighborhood uh, parties and gatherings of, of positivity and friendship and camaraderie. Be a good person, be a mensch, be the leader. And ultimately, the more light we shine, the more the darkness recedes into the background and disappears. And may indeed we experience the time very soon when all of the tears of all good people will be dried up and be replaced with a countenance of happiness. And indeed, May we have the time when only light prevails, darkness is no longer. Let us say, Amen. Thank you very much for joining me tonight for Torah Studies. I hope you, you enjoyed the class. I hope you appreciated the message. So indeed, let us all be light warriors and ambassadors of goodness and godliness. Um, Larry, jump in with a question. Yeah, well, it was, it was actually more of a comment. Many, oh, comment. Decades, many decades ago, um, uh, my history teacher in high school, um, who on Sundays was a pastor, he uh, he spent a little time one day talking about anti-Semitism, and it was his belief that it's it's partially caused because uh, Jews tend to be more outspoken, and he um, 
he said even in his classroom, uh, the few Jews that he, he saw were far more outspoken and would not remain as quiet as others in the classroom. And then the second part is that, uh, that some people consider Jews to be too tribal. Right. That was good. Yeah, all, both points were mentioned. We're too loud, too successful, right? And we're too, uh, we're too, we're too meek or too to ourselves and too separate. Yeah, all of that's mentioned. And there, of course, there's truth to it. I mean, because human beings, some people are loud, some people are quiet. So yeah, will you find Jews that are loud? Sure, you'll find anyone who's loud. Are there people that are tribal? Sure, some people just like to hang, to, to hang out with family and community and not, not venture out too far. Of course, you'll find Jews that hit all of those because you're talking about human traits. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not challenging what you're saying. I'm just saying that no. when you look at the larger picture, of course there are there are some that are like this and some that are like that. All of those rationales are not rationales at all. I mean, the scientific method says that if you want to prove something scientifically, right? So you experiment under the same conditions, and if the same conditions, the same ingredients cause the same outcome, that's it. What happens if every time you do the experiment, right? You change up all the factors and you have the same result. <laughs> but there's one constant that remains, right? You have like five ingredients. One stays the same. The four rotate in and out, but you have the same result. You're probably going to say it's probably the one thing that, that's constant. What's the one thing that's constant? <laughs> Jews. <laughs> that's it. Everything else is a variable, right? We've been in situations where we've been very successful. We've been in situations where we've been very not successful. The Jews in Poland... Through 200 years ago, were very not successful. And there were pogroms all the time. And now we control Hollywood and Wall Street and media and whatever and, and, and newspapers and what. Sure. We hardly I, control the media these days. Yeah, it's that's it, right. Us. Whatever. I, I mean, it's, yeah, you'll have all, you'll have all the above. I mean, it's, I, anyway. So all what's right. the, what's, yeah, Yaakov. Um, so is it also, that not only do we represent God, but we represent God as God's favorite people. So then, you know, there's favoritism and we're kind of set up for a lot of this. I don't know. I, I think that's a misnomer in what the chosen people means. Chosen doesn't mean um, favored. Chosen means chosen for a mission. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like we have, uh, there's a unique mission that we have. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and you know what Judaism says? Everyone in the world has seven, seven core mitzvot. And it's more than, I mean, seven core branched off into many more than that. Seven core mitzvot. You want 613? No problem. Come and get it. You can join. There's, there's no exclusivity. Chosen people. As if, again, I, I, you understand what I'm saying here. Chosen means you have a unique mission. The whole world has seven no eye laws. We have 613. I gave a class two Sundays ago about meat and milk. And if you eat meat, then your so tradition waits six hours for eating milk and you have to rinse out your mouth and do that. You want, you, and it, whoever wants that, no problem. Come and join. You don't have to, but if you want it, it's available. So you, you, you're, you're jealous that Jews are driving themselves crazy, spending $150 on an overpriced lemon before Sukkot? You oh. want that? Go ahead. How about By the way, I'm not, just, just to be very clear, I'm not demeaning it. I'm just saying, what's the, what's the- What's the advantage? No, how, not, how not how? even what's the advantage. It's it's not e exclusive in the sense that you can't get in. If you want in, do it. And what is in? More obligations. How but about more, I mean, sure. Dishes. Right, literally. And, and flatware and yeah. knives. Yeah. You got to have your, yes, yeah, for two dishwashers. <laughs> anyway, the point is two that sets of plastic, uh, I'm not work, complaining, too. just to be very clear, I'm not, I'm not fetching. I'm not complaining, God yeah. forbid, on the contrary, right? It's a beautiful thing. All I'm saying is that the idea that the, 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 the you know, anti-Semitism is driven by people that are, you know, that, that Jews um, hold themselves as superior I don't know that that's a thing. I, I think Jews <laughs> historically are kind of running to minion, you know, for mincha. That's what it is. It's like 
They're running to afternoon prayers and then back for Meyerv and then back again for Shabbos. They're running to Shul. I mean, I, it, it's like holding the superior, you're too busy. That's exactly. Like, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You're running. You're doing a mitzvah. You're doing this and that and the other. It's a lot of things to do. And whoever wants in, join. I mean, at the core of it, that's it. Anyway, the point is that that anti-Semitism is a deep-seated hatred. It's a hatred of at the core. I think. Um, I think there's even a quote. I, I don't. I don't know that I want to mention this, but I am literally mentioning. As I say, I don't want to mention it, but I am going to anyway. I think there's a line from Hitler even that says, "I don't know if it's a true quote or not." Something about the Jew being hated because of of conscience, like the Jew brings out the conscience of of human beings. I don't know something. Well, along there's those. a similar quote, Rabbi, that actually our enemies in yeah. the day, the Nazis, knew us best. And the quote was in their Hitler Youth um, song, where in the in the English translation, basically the the verse goes, "We are the joyous Hitler Youth. We need no stinking Christian virtue. Our furor, furor is our savior and future. The Pope and Rabbi shall be gone. We wish to be pagans once again." And I think that sums it up. It's their hatred of moral values as given in the Torah by Hashem, and that's yep. what we represent, and they hate that, and they want to go back to being pagans again, and so if they eliminate the messenger, the Torah bearer, then they get to go back and do that, and I mean, I don't know how much more plain our enemies could have made it. That's that's a powerful quote. I don't think I've encountered that. I don't think I've seen that before, but thank you for sharing that. I mean, that is, that's oh. pretty, that's pretty plain as day right there. We wish to be pagans. That's we wish to be pagans. That's that's uh yeah that's right there. Well, I mean, look, yeah, and 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 the idea of like, what what is pagan? Like somebody might say, well, what, what does that even mean? Well, that means that there. I mean, that's essentially that there's no higher authority. There's no moral. There's no absolute unified moral compass. Paganism is the idea that there are multiple gods. I.e., choose your own adventure. Right. It's like it's like whatever you want is now, you know, justified because there's a God for this. But it this wasn't whatever God they wanted. That. It was it was Hitler was. No. The... Yeah. But that's always like that. Right. It's, it's the, it's the, in the vacuum. Uh, yeah. There's always a because in the vacuum of that authority. So someone says, oh, I guess I'll be the authority. Right. It's like we're going to soon read the Torah portion of Korach. He's like, no, everyone's holy. We don't need Moses. We don't need Aaron. Let's get rid of leadership. And then what? And then I guess I'll be the leader. leader. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Communism, right? Socialists, like, oh, everyone's equal. But I guess we'll have those in charge that that coordinate everything else for everybody, right? Uh, animal farm. All animals are created equal, but some are created more equal than others. Look, human, uh, I don't know, human flaws and foibles and stuff is is the stuff of legends um, in a negative way. But that's what we deal with. Look, it's 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 uh, it's endemic to the human condition. Um, Jews have been scapegoated. It's not not the only people that's been scapegoated. Certainly, there's been other peoples and other races certainly that have had terrible histories of persecution. This is, of course, a class about uh, about anti-Semitism specifically and about the dangers, but also about at the core, it's about representation and about godliness. And the message, hopefully, is it, it's entirely meant to be a positive one, and that is lean into it, lean into who you are, lean into the calling, lean into something higher, live that higher life, let God figure out how to scatter the enemies as it were and, and make hatred dissipate and, and light. But let, we, let's bring more light into the world. Let's not run away from that because that, that certainly doesn't help. Then, then, then you're, I don't know, then you're not, not here or not there either. It's like in the middle of nowhere. So that as well, let's, let's, let's lean into where we need to be. I'll does also that say that- mean not, Does that mean not fight? You know, because the Israelis the, who, have, who have fought in wars, there they would say the opposite. There, they'd be like, you know, that's that's really the true Jew is the one that that fights against the enemies because you God's know, not going to do it for us. So it's it's an interesting. So I, I think the the true answer is there's a um the, the, the biblical story where Moses sees an Egyptian uh, beating up a Jew and killing a Jew, yeah. and he steps in and strikes the Egyptian and and kills the Egyptian to save the life of the Jew. And there's a machloket, there's a dispute in the Midrash as to how he killed them. One says that he killed them with uh, his fist. The other one says he killed them with the shovel. And the other one says he killed them with, uh, by, by chanting one of the names of God and killing them that way. 
And the questions asked, I mean, I mean, we know rabbis like to dispute things, but a story about Moses and the Egyptian, we have three opinions as to how that happened. Like that's, that's next level. Like what's going on. But I once saw a commentary that said, no, 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 this is a truth, the modern truth. How do we combat the anti-Semitism that's beating up the Jew? The anti-Semite, sorry, that's beating up the Jew. One opinion says the fist. You got to, you got that, you got to fight. As you just mentioned, you got to fight IDF, strong military, strong force, shout down the anti-Semite, fight fire with fire. That's the fist. The other one says shovel. You got to build, you got to dig, you got to create alliances, diplomacy, you know, APAC, whatever it is, you got to create the, the, you, you got to, you know, schmooze up Congress, bring them to Israel. You got to build the case. So we've been, that, we've been trying the uh, diplomacy angle as well. So there's this, the, there's the strength and the might side, there's the diplomacy side, and then there's the word of God side, which is the prayer and the, and the Torah study and the mitzvot. That's the spiritual side. And which, what's the answer? I don't all know. The Midrash says all three. Yeah, right? The answer three. is all the above. You need all the above. You so need. So far, nothing's working. Well, we don't have Mashiach yet. So, yeah, listen. I, I, but we I, have to wait for the Mashiach. I'm sorry. I, 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 I wish I had. I appreciate this pass in the message, but from what I see, God's responsibility to defend himself from his opponents and enemies and come to our rescue. I'm quoting from the text here. I I'm have, waiting for him to come to our rescue. He never has before. Toba, I have no problem holding God to accountability for this. Good. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Okay. And so maybe our concluding message is, because we'll let everybody go, it's already getting late, is God, we know you're listening. Time to step up. Time to time to hold on to your end. We're going to hold on to our end of the bargain. We're going to be good ambassadors, but you got to step up to your end of the deal and and end and the negativity and the pain and the suffering and bring bring the good times. And let us say, Amen. 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 Yeah, let us say, Amen. In this one. All right. Great to see you guys. Um, no class tomorrow. Uh, it's we're in a little bit of a lighter summer cycle. We have obviously the Sunday class. We have the Tuesday class. Um, we are going to announce some upcoming events and some brand new courses and opportunities, both evening time and daytime stuff happening soon. Stay tuned for the big announcements that are forthcoming because we have a lot of very cool things that are that are brewing. All right. See y'all. Um, Arif Tov, good evening. Thank you. And uh, see you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.